All right, good morning. And um, today is Wednesday, and uh, we're in, in week four, and uh, uh, we're covering um, chapter 11 in the text. And a couple of, I have a few announcements before we get going, and uh, particularly if you're watching on the uh, on the video uh, feed, you want to make sure that you are, are mindful of these. But uh, I want to take a look at the syllabus first of all, because we, had, we do have a discussion activity scheduled for this week, and, uh, and so you want to make sure you go in sometime before Sunday and make your initial uh, reply to the, to the prompts, and, and just try to be thorough with responding to all pieces of the prompt and uh, making sure that you're answering the questions. And I and one thing about this, I, just, just a couple of, of pointers here just to help you maximize your grade, because I do think it's important to do. I know sometimes people omit, just sort of forget to do the discussions, but I think this is probably a, a, about the easiest credit that there is in this course. And uh, and the grading is, is not particularly severe, but it, it does, you know, it, it is uh, about being thorough and about addressing uh, all of the prompts that are uh, presented. And, um, and and I wouldn't go too far with it. I, I wouldn't view it as a paper at all. I wouldn't even view it as a mini paper. It's just, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a participation activity, uh, obviously not in real time. And the, the initial reply, should be as as informed by the textbook readings and by the reading and by the material in class as much as possible. So, uh, kind of focus on that if you would, just to try to stay relevant. You want to make two of the follow up posts to those of other class participants. You can even reply to me if you like; it doesn't matter. And um, and it, it doesn't be formal. And I, I would never, I wouldn't on any of these discussion activities do anything like including citations or references. Uh, it's not a uh, a research activity necessarily. It just should be informed by the, the course material. And the, the key thing on, on the replies, something I've noticed over time, is, is that it, there does seem to be a tendency to become a little bit overly informal and, and conversational, even a little bit chatty. And that's probably the wrong direction to go there. You want to stay relevant. I, I'm not saying you can't be a little bit conversational and, and friendly. I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that is, is the case. But uh, we usually, as a rule of thumb, we say a good paragraph relating to the content of, at hand. So a minimum of three sentences, I guess, is how we might uh, define uh, formally what a paragraph is. And so uh, and, and related to the topic at hand. And if you want to include any other any other things that are conversational or related or looping back to something somebody else said, that's fine. It's perfectly fine to do that. Just don't make that the entirety of the post. Okay, so that's one thing. And you want to post sometime before Sunday, which is the 22nd. The, the, the homework quiz and bonus, I'm going to defer the due date on those until the following Sunday and uh, to the 29th. And uh, I didn't, on Tuesday, I'm sorry, on Monday in class, I wasn't quite sure how far we would get into chapter 11. I know it's not a particularly long chapter. It's, it's uh, content-wise, it may be about two-thirds of the length. I would say just, I'm just shooting from the hip here about how long that is in comparison to some of the other chapters, but I did, I wasn't sure, and I didn't want to, I don't want to turn you loose on the homework quiz and bonus without having at least some exposure on, from my part as to having worked some of the, the, the problems and exercises for the back of the chapter. So the due date on those will be the 29th. I will adjust those in Brightspace and also on the checklist. I'll do that today. And, uh, and we'll just deal with chapter 12 as we come to it. And, um, and again, I, and I know for people who have already done chapter 11, you, you can still do it again if you like. I mean, there's no, there's no problem there. And even if you're out of your three homework attempts and you want to start again, I, I can, we can make that happen if you want. So you haven't lost time. And I know some people like to work ahead. They work quickly. Uh, and everyone's schedule is unique and different. And um, so that's entirely up to you if you want to do that. When we come back, so when we come back on Monday, we will do, because I don't think we're going to get into the homework and, or I'm sorry, to the exercises in the back of the chapter uh, today. I just don't think we're going to have time. So we'll do that on Monday and we'll probably have about a half an hour left in order to get into job or costing chapter 12. And that's really a, it's a unique area. We probably need a good two weeks to cover that. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the chapter 12 work as we approach it. And then uh, our first exam is coming up two weeks from this week and that's exam one. And before we get to that, I'll talk, I'll have much more to say about that. I'll talk much more about that exam, okay? So make sure you do the, the, the discussions for this week and just 
get those knocked out. Hopefully everyone will have gotten through the readings and have viewed the uh, the videos and whatnot and are up to speed in that in that direction. Okay, any questions about that for anybody? I know we have a few people on the live stream and uh, and feel free to shout out if you do. All right, one other thing, this is a, I got, I got a mea culpa. I goofed, uh, messed up uh, a little bit, a little bit, not a big time. But I, it's been about a year and a half since I've done an attend anywhere. And what I was not doing was creating a link for attendance for those who are watching um, asynchronously, that is on the video, the YouTube video, which is the majority of the class. And I, and I understand that, and, and that's perfectly fine. If you attended in class, we've got your attendance because I have everyone sign in. If you, and if you're watching on the live Zoom, we captured your attendance there too. But uh, what I did not do, and I had forgotten, just totally... It's just totally on me. Forgot to create an attendance link where you, all you do is check in and um, and say I watched the videos for week whatever on this day. And so I'm going to do that for the first three weeks. And so just go in if you watch it asynchronously and say I watched the videos on whatever day. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm, you know, you probably don't have it written down. And I realize it's not a, an appropriate system. But we are required to record attendance. It's a Department of Education requirement. Uh, and it's just something I had missed. But I, and, and going forward, I'll post it. It'll be under, under the discussions link. So if you go into coursework content, I'm sorry, cor yeah, coursework content, coursework discussions. I'm sorry, coursework discussions. There'll be a link. It'll be obvious where it is. It's not a not a big deal. And there's you don't have to put very much on. Just say I was there, whatever day. Okay. And that's the way that you'll record attendance for the attend anywhere. There's no other way to, to really do it, particularly since we don't have discussion activities every week. Uh, in the course, okay? So that will be, so look for that. You'll see that, it'll be there. And uh, and I apologize for having forgotten that, but uh, it is, since I don't do attend anywhere courses all that often anymore, um, it just slipped my mind, okay? One other thing, this, and then we'll get into the, the content, is uh, my office hours are on Monday uh, from 12 to one, right after this class. And those are the dedicated office hours for this section and I'll be there and I'm in the G building in room 201. Now I had not gotten a, an office or a cubicle space assigned uh, at the beginning of the term and for whatever reason, and, I, and I, I thought, well, I would deal with it because usually that station is manned and I think it's usually uh, employees that were up there and I could just you know arrange it at that time. But it, it doesn't appear to be staffed at all anymore. In fact, that area is sort of empty. So I just sort of camped out at the there's a little common area there, and that's where I was holding my office hours. I don't think that's going to work very well. Um, it doesn't afford very much confidentiality to a student who might want to stop by. Somebody did stop by, and I thought, well, this is not, this is rather chaotic. So I did get cubicle space assigned to myself, and uh, just knowing that uh, that was probably the way to do it. So now there is nobody at the front desk. So, and I don't know how quickly it's going to be that they update the, the little, uh, placard out front there with the, with the number. So I'm going to give you my cell phone number and just call me on this. It's 505-977-4632. You can just call me and I wouldn't text me. I would call me and say, hey, I'm outside and I'll, and I'll come to the door. It's no problem. And I, as I said, the very first day of class as well, if there's another time you need to meet with me or location, I'm mostly at Maine <clears throat> throughout the rest of the week, then just, you know, I'll, I'll, I can make a time to get with you. Uh, if you want to meet your Montoya, that's perfectly fine, too. I'm up this way a lot, so it's not a problem. But uh, that's the best way to reach me in lieu of uh, calling my extension. And I have no idea what it is because I'm not even sure if and when that's going to be updated. And there's, a, maybe there's like a listing, a roster of faculty members that wasn't updated. And for whatever reason, I didn't, uh, probably because I'm not here on a routine basis, they didn't put me on the list, so. Uh, anyway, uh, I do have an actual location now, and uh, and I do have an actual office at my at main campus, so uh, I didn't just uh, you know come in off the street. So, okay, questions about any of those uh, announcements there? All right, just that was just some some uh, updates, and I think those are important to know about. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Any any questions for me before we get going about anything with regard to the course content uh, activities? Things coming up, etc. Um, hey, Tom. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I think where we left off, at least uh, I flagged my notes, was we were ready to get to the third of the fourth of the four 
learning objectives in chapter 11. And chapter 11, once again, I'll just kind of uh, uh, reiterate what I've said before about this. This is kind of a an intro chapter to the, the sort of broader topic of managerial accounting. And so it covers a, a lot of things, some, some in, in some detail, particularly with relate, in relation to cost and manufacturing cost in particular. Um, and then others, as we get into at the very end of this, this module, uh, a little bit more superficially, but yet as an introductory preview of, of things to come. And we'll talk about some, some things that are coming up later in the course, just to kind of get your mind, you know, jump started and prepped for what's coming. And just to give you a bit of a, uh, a preview as to what some of the, the, uh, the topics are that are coming up in this course. As I mentioned, and I've mentioned a couple times before, that there's a heavy emphasis on manufacturing in, in managerial accounting. And this has been the case since really the beginning, as far as I can tell from, uh, man from managerial accounting. And I know that, and, and we, we talk a lot about the fact that the economy itself has been changing over quite some time where uh, the faster growing areas of the economy are not manufacturing, they're more service oriented and, uh, and high tech and technology in many ways can be included in that very broad service sector, particularly areas like software development and systems development and whatnot. Um, also healthcare uh, growing areas. It's not that manufacturing's not, manufacturing's not growing, it's just not growing as quickly. And frankly, we have lost quite a lot of manufacturing in this country to offshore that is relocating manufacturing elsewhere. So this begs the question then, okay, if manufacturing is, is diminishing as a contribution to overall economic output, then why are we focused so much on it in managerial accounting? That's a good question. It's something that we are uh, mulling over in our department at the moment. Um, but I will say this, and the the answer to that, and I think it's a good answer, it's, it's, it's a truthful one, is that a lot of the concepts that we cover in manufacturing have applicability to service organizations as well. And we'll prove it to you as we get into talking more about service organizations and how they differ. When we talk about service companies, the key thing to know is that they are often very light on equipment, property plant equipment, that, that category under right under current assets usually on a balance sheet. They're very light on that usually. Um, Software companies, as I have mentioned before, don't have much in the way of heavy assets, probably not very much at all in the way of vehicles, very little office space relative to the amount of revenue that they can create. So it's heavy, it's light on that. But one thing that is most important is that they lack inventory. And that's probably a good thing, which is one reason why these organizations are fast growing is because they don't have the problems of inventory to deal with. However, there is inventory involved in uh, any kind of merchandising operation and certainly in manufacturing, but there are differences between how we account for inventory in merchandising and how we account for them in manufacturing. We've begun to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk some more about that now as we get going into it. So here are some of the differences between manufacturing and merchandising. For, before we get into this, though, let me just make sure that everyone is... is familiar with what we mean by, by merchandising. Merchandising operations, they're either mostly retailers, but also wholesalers. These are not companies that make anything. They take finished goods and move them around, distribute them, price them, promote them, and make them available to buyers, either on a wholesale or retail basis. So there's no, and maybe there's some work that they may do on the goods, but it's superficial. It's maybe assembling light, very light assembly or you know, that sort of, or, or repackaging. It's not, it is not creating a good out of raw materials. So all the retailers that we know about are all merchandisers, Walmart, Walgreens, Family Dollar, whatever, <clears throat> are merchandisers, okay? Both wholesale and retail. Uh, manufacturers are ones that obviously do create things. And we'll start from some sort of raw material and make uh, some finished good. And we're gonna talk about the stages that these, uh, these, 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 this output undergoes as it goes from very raw materials all the way to finished goods. And we'll get to that here shortly. But in terms of how they differ in terms of financial statement presentation, the two key ones that we're gonna really focus on this course are balance sheet and income statement. Obviously, there are from, you might recall from, manager, from financial accounting that there are four statements that are created as part of gap reporting 
if for external users, balance sheet income statement, retained earnings statement, statement of cash flows. Those last two we're not really going to cover, I don't think at all, in any uh, meaningful way in this course. Certainly not even, we didn't even really get into the cash flow statement that much in 2110. But we're going to focus on these two here. And only to talk about how the costing of goods as we move through the production process is reflected on a balance sheet. And it's in the current assets section because what, it, what are current assets? Again, what is the definition of current assets? It's those assets which are going to be converted to cash sometime within a year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. The operating cycle is, a, is just sort of a cash to cash cycle, which very often is much shorter than a year. So one year is sort of a, a benchmark rule of thumb for current assets. I mean, there are some goods that take longer than a year to convert you know, to something, if you're long-term like construction and maybe building aircraft or whatever, or your operating cycle is much longer, but for the most part, uh, a year would, would suffice. And so inventory, which is what how we account for all goods, really, even those goods that are, that are not even done yet, are reflecting current assets. So it's going to differ there. And it's also going to differ, probably most importantly, for where we're going in this course. It differs in its treatment and its impact on the cost of goods sold part of the income statement. Okay, so cost of goods sold is, is something that we have talked about in 2110, in the, the lead up to this course. <clears throat> cost of goods sold is simply the release of the cost of those inventory items that are sold that are not expensed until they're sold. And they're expensed through this expense account here called cost of goods sold. And at this point, um, in, in 2110, we didn't really get into very much. I think we just had a little bitty sliver of information about manufactured goods, but we sort of took all the goods that's finished and we were reselling them. And that's fine. A lot of business that deals with inventory does that very right thing. But we are going to go a little bit backwards in the uh, production chain and talk about companies that do assemble goods for that are finished. And so we're going to talk about the inventory accounts, okay? And there are going to be three main categories of inventory accounts. We're going to have raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And let's talk a bit about what those are. And I, I want to be clear that, that we're not talking about the costs uh, associated with this, which we talked about before, because before we talked about direct material. We, we said the three categories of, of manufacturing costs. We said the direct materials direct labor, which together we simply call direct costs. And then one other category, and that's manufacturing overhead. These are manufacturing costs, okay? And these are costs that are dumped in inventory, okay? These are expense items, and these are, and these are obviously, since they're costs, they're reflected in, uh, as always, 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 as dollar figures. Direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. We're going to be talking about these a lot in this course. And the reason I talk about and differentiate direct materials, direct labor, and categorize those together as direct costs is the fact that they are not, by definition, indirect costs, which is really what manufacturing overhead really represents. And we talked a bit about overhead on Monday, and there's much more to come on overhead in this course. And as before we leave today, we'll get into a little bit more of a preview as to some of the alternative methods by which we uh, record overhead. Again, overhead is a term we've probably all heard for a long time, and it's and maybe weren't even thinking about what it is. I mean, I think you think about literally overhead as being the, the buildings which you operate, you know, lighting and the, the air conditioning and all that uh, kind of thing. And yes, it would include that. And it, but it's got to be directly related to product costs, okay, to the cost of the product itself. And remember, overhead has got two main characteristics. Number one, it's so indirect, it's related to the production of the good or service. In this case, it's going to be a good because it's manufacturing. It's directly related, but it's difficult to attach to the product itself. Um, it's things like, um, a lot of it's direct, indirect labor, including things like security guards and quality control inspectors, the, 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 the management plant manager's salary, those kinds of things are indirect. And, and by the way, I know that sometimes we present manufacturing as being one company making one good, but when in reality, a lot of companies make a number of goods in the same facility. And so imagine the nightmare that would be if you try to take 
the plant manager's salary and divide it among the seven or eight different products that are made in that one plant, it'd be, it'd be difficult. So we just include it here. But we've got ways that we can attach it to products, but still indirectly because they are indirect. That's one characteristic. The other is they are part of the cost of product. They're so infinitesimally small that it just makes sense to lump them together and 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 just include it in manufacturing inventory. And the examples I talked about before, things like paint and screws and bolts and little knickknack items and, and heat little drops of glue and all these kinds of things. And if you really, if you really, really, really wanted to get micro, you, I guess you could take the the cost of individual drops of glue on some product and, um, and, and and cost that out. And there are efforts to do that, and some companies do. But for the most part, we're going to take the position that's indirect. Okay? That's part of OPED. So those two characteristics, uh, they're, they're too indirect. They can't be applied to product costs because they apply mostly to the facility as a whole, or the costs are too infinitesimally small to track down. And also, there's a lot of wastage, particularly when it comes to things like paints and finishes, uh, like a lot of goods are spray painted, and so there's a lot of paint that sort of evaporates. And, and how do you, on Earth, uh, begin to cost out the the molecules of paint that are flying away? It's just, it's really, it, it doesn't make sense to do that, okay? So these are costs. Now, what about product costs is important to know. Product costs, remember from Monday, are what we call inventoriable. That is, we can take the costs of operations that we can, of making the product and dump them in inventory accounts. And so if you think about this, this is a, a sort of a value change, starting out with raw materials and, and work in processes or goods that are, as the term suggests, not done. They're being worked on. They will be, at some point, finished goods. Looks like they're making kayaks in this example here, okay? One thing about raw materials that I should mention as well, and it's something that um, is important to think about, because I think a lot of times we think of raw materials as being extremely raw, something that just came out of the ground or, or was just slaughtered or was just mined or cut down or whatever. And that's not always the case. A raw material could include something like, uh, you know, plastic, which is obviously not a natural product. It's got to be created somewhere. It's somebody else's finished product that's then shipped to you, and you've got big rolls of plastic that you're doing things with that you're fabricating uh, things uh, out of or sheets of metal, or bars of steel, or whatever it is, right? Um, if, you're, uh, if you're a builder, you might get lumber, right? That is, to you, a raw material, to you, the builder, but it's somebody else's finished output. Somebody had to create the lumber out of timber, right? So you get this idea that, that raw materials are raw to you because you can't do anything with them. You, can't, you, don't, you don't want to sell them. You want to use them to create a finished good. So this is, and we're going to talk more about this. Obviously, this is a, a pretty simplified little picture. And I know that all these slides are in your text. And so you can refer back to them and, and, and view that. But, that's the, but those are the inventory accounts. And we're going to be sort of tracing the cost of goods as they move along, or the cost of production as it moves along through the production process, ultimately to become cost of goods sold. Okay? So when we talk about the differences, remember, we are focusing on the differences between uh, manufacturing and merchandising in terms of statement preparation, statement reflection. And I'm trying to blow this up as best I can. I guess the good news for those of you watching on the video feed is you can uh, blow it up as big as you want on your own screen. And you've got the textbook too. So, all right, on the left, a, 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 a fragment, a, a cutaway extract of a balance sheet and that of a manufacturer for merchandisers in a, the same for a manufacturing company. Notice that current assets are not terribly difficult until you get down to inventory. Remember, there are the big three on current assets, always, always, cash, accounts receivable, which are trade receivables, and inventory, if you are a company that has inventory. Okay, now in this case, we're, we're saying both of these uh, types of entities do. And it would be nice if the cash receivables figures were the same dollar figures, but uh, for whatever reason, the authors chose not to do that. So notice what is what is different. It's obviously very simple on a merchandising operation. You have cash, receivables, and inventory, one light on for inventory, and that's it. Now you do have prepaid expenses, and that is definitely a, a prepaid item or a current asset item. And remember what prepaids are. Prepaids are uh, what we call deferrals. Those are things where something has been paid for by you, the, the company. It's an asset because it has future service value. 
And um, it usually is something that is, it, it, the value is gonna be earned over time. The big category here almost always, not always, but all, but is, is extremely common, obviously, is prepaid insurance. Insurance is one of those products that's very unique in the sense that it pretty much always has to be paid for up front. And uh, as a result, the buyer has a prepaid expense. The seller, in this case, the insurance company would have unearned revenue as a liability. One party's asset is another party's liability. But let's focus on, on, on the prepaid. Those are common to both, okay? The big difference, obviously, which is in red, is inventory. So over here, the manufacturer, they've got manufacturing organization, they've got cash receivables. And the inventory, you've got these three categories, finished goods, working process, or we just call WIP, uh, for short, and raw materials. And together, they become part of the inventory account and part of current assets generally, okay? Let me say this about um, the presentation in manufacturing organizations as they relate to the balance sheet and, and, the, and the presentation to external users. And, and some of this is, is, is sort of expanded just for our purposes here. In reality, a lot of companies would choose to have one line item for inventory, even extremely large manufacturers with many different kinds of products and diverse operations and very sophisticated accounting for inventory. The reason they do it is to, to keep it simple and there are also strategic reasons that they a lot of times don't want their competitors to know what the elements of every line item on their financial statements are. Some companies will go into great detail in the notes to discuss what uh, is going on with those, others will not. And uh, as long as they do what the minimal amount of reporting that the uh, that FASB requires, and ultimately the Securities and Exchange Commission requires, all to the good. So you may not see this on a real balance sheet. So if you pull up a manufacturer, you may not see this broken down into finished goods, working process, and raw materials, but they're there, okay? And this sort of brings me to an, another point. That is, a lot of what we do in managerial accounting is internal reporting and accounting that's really not for public consumption. And in fact, a lot of the reporting and schedules and things that we're going to see in this course is often considered confidential, that, it, that, that uh, it's not always desirable that the world sees what's going on with our cost structure and uh, our makeup of inventory and how much we've gotten work in process and, and all that. And uh, uh, it might be strategically, for strategic reasons, uh, kept under wraps. Okay. All right. And you know, I can recall when I was in the business world, starting out in, in junior levels of management, we would get internal reports. We didn't deal with inventory, but we would get all kinds of internal reports. And sometimes some of the data would be X'd out, just be omitted from my view because I was not authorized to see it. I wasn't high enough up in the pecking order to get that. And that's um, it's very common. That information is not always available to everyone. And this is a management philosophy that differs across organizations. Next company I went to was extremely open with everyone. They didn't care. And uh, they thought we can compete. We don't care about our competitors. We are doing our own thing. And that's just a different idea. But I, I do should point out though that in general, a lot of the managerial reporting is, is for internal use only. Okay. All right. So I want to come back and talk a little bit about this here because where where these differ, because all right, so that was balance sheet presentation. Income statement presentation is a little bit different. I'll get to a couple example extracts of an income statement in a minute. <laughs> but notice this. <clears throat> what you've got going on here is a merchandiser on the top uh, flow here, and then a manufacturing organization on the bottom. And notice you've got a cost of goods purchased and a cost of goods manufacturing. The two are analogous to one another. I want to go back and uh, I'm going to try to make the camera move here a little bit. And, uh, and hopefully everyone can see this okay. Um, you might recall that in a periodic inventory system, periodic inventory system, where we go back at some point, at, usually after the end of some accounting period, quarter, a year, whatever. Then we go back and we determine what the cost of goods sold were. And it starts with, and it's based upon this particular logic. And you have seen this before, but I want to make sure that you have this somewhere locked, in, locked down in your memory banks, or at least written down, just so you have it, okay? Because it really, it's, it's not so much related to finished goods as it is 
a methodology for, for calculating cost based upon beginning values and ending values and everything that came in between, okay? Remember what an income statement is. Remember the, the metaphor that has been used uh, since time immemorial. An income statement is a motion picture that takes into account everything that happened, for the most part, from the beginning of an accounting period to the end. So January 1st to December 31st, if that's the fiscal year the company's employing. Whereas a balance sheet is a snapshot, right? Well, obviously, if we're talking about trying to get the cost of goods sold, which is an income statement item, then we need to account for what happened throughout, throughout the period. So with a periodic system, we take beginning inventory plus, an, and there's an account called purchases or sometimes called cost of purchases. And I think we'll see this. Um, and I know we have different terms for the same thing, which I know drives people crazy. And I, I know that would be very nice if we could just agree on one single term for every item. Just call costs cost, not cost expenses or profit is, you know, just call profit profit, not income or earnings. But we don't. So we just kind of have to live with it. So beginning inventory, where we started, let's say, now let's just say it was January the 1st, plus purchases, which took place between January the 1st and December 31st. And together, these two represent goods available for sale. And you might see this as goods available for sale or cost of goods available for sale, COGAS. Sometimes you might see that acronym if you're, you know, knocking on doors on the internet. Or you might just see it as gas, goods available for sale, that direction. These are all the goods that were available throughout that time period from 1-1 to 12-31. They weren't all um, sold. Some of it did not get sold. And so if we account for ending inventory as of a certain date, 1231 in this case, and subtract that. This is a subtraction side here. This may be a little bit hard to see, I don't know. Then you end up with cost of goods sold, okay? Which is an income statement item, obviously, okay? All right, and, and again, uh, this is a methodology for arriving at a cost of goods. And by the way, you, if you if you take a look at this, this, this just this bottom category, if take goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals, I'm sorry, goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. You can invert this. If you know uh, what cost of goods sold is, you could subtract cost of goods sold and get ending inventory. All we're doing is playing around with the algebra here. No big deal, really. So, you know, those are, they're really, it's the same formula. We're just sort of moving things around. Okay, and to get cost of goods sold. Now, this is a periodic structure. This is what's used throughout periodic accounting. And a lot of companies will use this, particularly if they don't employ the opposite of a periodic system, which is called a perpetual system. And I might refresh your memory on what a perpetual system is. A perpetual accounting system is one that is re really relying upon technology and the, and, and the identification of goods by category or what we call by SKU, stock keeping unit, and it's usually bigger retailers, bigger wholesalers that will, and, and others that will deal with the ability to record in more or less real time what's going on with inventory. And they, there is no purchases ledger in the accounting books at all. It doesn't exist. If they buy an inventory, it goes in inventory right away. If an inventory is sold, it goes into cost of goods sold right away. So we don't have to go, this is why it differs from the periodic system where we gotta go back and recreate history based upon what we know. Perpetual system does this in real time and it's really only been made possible through technology. And, and, I, and, I, want to, and I don't even wanna suggest that, period, that perpetual systems are something new because they've been around even before the internet. I, I know I worked at Target when I was in college and that was a long time ago. And every time somebody bought aspirin or diapers or whatever, it would come off the books right away. They would go out over the phone lines. Sound familiar? It was the, the early internet. But it wasn't an internet. It wasn't a, it, there was no talking back and forth. It was just a one-way transmission. So it's been around for a long time. And uh, the perpetual system is what differenti is, is differentiated from the periodic system. But that doesn't mean the periodic system is not relevant, because it is. Particularly when it comes to accounting for uh, some of these categories of inventory, raw materials, working process, etc. cetera. Um, and particularly when it comes to direct materials, it's a big issue, and we're going to talk about that in a second. So, 
for merchant managers, this is really nothing different than what I just wrote on the board. Beginning inventory plus purchases or cost of goods purchased, whatever you prefer. Minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. So far, so good. We know we've covered that in the previous class. With manufacturing, we start with beginning, beginning finished goods. These are goods that were ready to be sold and probably are now gone at the end of this accounting period. Plus the cost of goods manufactured, which is the which is the, uh, the the analogous concept to purchases, except we didn't purchase goods, we made goods, minus those ending finished goods, which have not yet been sold, and that gives us cost of goods sold. That's the way that we back into cost of goods sold in a manufacturing context. Okay, and we and, and that's really what periodic costing systems do is allow us to back into those costs themselves. So any questions about this? Um, and I know we're going to get into this a bit more here in just a second, this idea of what COGM, cost of goods manufactured, is. Cost of goods manufactured, just think about it as the cost of, of making goods, really. Uh, it's what, is, what, is, what does it cost to make a finished good? And I would capture all these um, elements as they move along the production line, raw materials, work in process, finished goods. And by the way, uh, these are inventory accounts, but then they pick up cost as they go along, right? So just think about this. As goods are moving along the production process to become finished goods, what they're doing is they're absorbing cost. And in fact, we call that, we actually call that absorption. And we call this absorption costing. We're picking up cost. We're picking up materials cost. We're picking up labor along the way. We're picking up overhead cost until we get to the point where we get finished goods. The finished goods is the cost of, it, of, the, of those finished goods. They haven't been sold yet. They haven't been sold yet. So they're, remember, goods have not yet been sold or are in, in all contexts, all inventory contexts, manufacturing as well as merchandising, part of inventory. We don't, re, we don't record any kind of expense of those until they're sold. So they're bound up in inventory. They're, in other words, we say they're capitalized costs until those goods are sold. That is a concept that is common to pretty much every industry that we see in accounting, okay? All right, so as we're moving along, we're absorbing costs along the, the line of production. Well, let's talk a bit about um, uh, what this looks like. So we taught, we, we showed a, a bit of an extract of a, a partial balance sheet for a merchandiser versus a manufacturer. And notice that on the income statement itself, we get have a cost of goods sold figure. And how do we get to cost of goods sold? Well, beginning plus, beginning inventory plus purchases or cost of goods purchased. Is goods available for sale or cost of goods available for sale? Remember, the GAFS is just my own, I'm not the only one who uses it, uh, uh, notation. Sometimes people call this COGAS, cost of goods available for sale. I don't like the COGAS because it looks too much like COGS. I just, I, 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 it's too, too, for me, it's too close for comfort. So minus ending inventory, gives us cost of goods sold, okay? That's, it's that, basically, that we talked about. Where it differs from manufacturing is the idea that we start with finished goods as of the beginning of the year. Cost of goods manufacturing, which is, again, analogous to the purchase of finished goods in the case of a merchandiser, which gives us goods available for sale minus finished goods equals cost of goods sold, okay? That is a general outline, and cost of goods manufacturing can be thought of as being analogous to cost of goods purchased or purchases. And I use the term purchases because um, you might see this in your future life at some point. If you work in an organization that deals with um, inventory, you might just have a purchases account, just called purchases. And, uh, and that's where stuff goes in. And, and all it does is go one way. It, as you're buying things, buying things, buying things, you're just accumulating elements in the purchases account. At the end of an accounting period, at the end of that, because it's a periodic system, you just close that account up, start again, start a new motion picture at the new accounting period. So you may see that purchases is simply an account. It's an asset account. It's an inventory account, really. Okay, and it's it's really just a it's really just a ledger is, is all it is. Okay, all right. So income statements for both. Let me. You know, this is a little bit too big. All right. So let's just take a look at this. This is a little bit busy. I don't know if I like this particular slide or not, but I guess you either like it or you don't like it. I don't know. 
Don't forget manufacturing costs. Okay. And again, these differ from period costs. Remember, we've got two kinds of costs in general in any organization, product costs. And these are these are things like direct materials, direct labor, overhead, and then period costs, which don't relate to the product itself, which include things like salaries of staff, personnel, like accountants and attorneys and IT people and HR uh, people and things like rent on the on office space, not production space, but office space, advertising, freight costs, freight out, those kinds of things. So these are all manufacturing costs. Those three categories of product costs, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing, overhead, okay? And then we've got work in process, okay? Work in process is an important, it's an inventory account, okay? These are expenses, these are costs, this is an inventory account. And so we've got a beginning work in process, and then we've got new manufacturing costs, which again are going to be dumped into an inventory account called the WIP account as goods are moving along the production process. Now, if this is, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, if it's not completely clear to you, because I have been doing this a little bit long enough to know that sometimes people look at like, hmm, What's this work in process? I, my hope is that it becomes clearer once you start working through some of this. This is one of the reasons why I would encourage you to do the adaptive exercises, for, not for credit. If you want, you can do it. Or there are lots and lots and lots of problems in the back of the text to do. The odd ones even give you the answer. And, um, and I, I, that's uh, the thing about accounting is one of the best ways to learn it is simply to do it. And I know that's not always what everyone wants to hear, but it is really the way it works. Uh, just to kind of do it, see how these things fit together. And uh, I always found it was useful to do it even by hand. And I know I said it completely old school, but there is something about putting these things together, recognizing how these categories fit together. So how these categories fit together is we start with the beginning work in process. Not finished goods. That's 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 later on as we get going down the road. We're trying to get to cost of goods manufacturing. We're trying to get to the item that becomes analogous to purchases in the period in the, uh, in the merchandising concept. So we start at the beginning with this is stuff that, that as we begin this accounting period it is being worked on. It's in the process of being completed. Okay. And we know a lot of goods take some time to put together and and uh, and there's always some sort of work in process. By the way, if we if just at the sometimes just at the risk of of thinking that we only want to talk about manufacturing. Work in process is also a service sector concept. <clears throat> you know, in the accounting profession, we if we are working on, on cases that we're not quite done, then it's an audit engagement or it's a tax, uh, it's a tax engagement, we're not quite done. We'll simply dump it into a file called the work called the WIP file. And, and if we've accumulated hours, billable hours, that's part of the uh, the cost of doing that. And it's important for us to know what it costs to do those kinds of things. So again, it sounds like this is only unique to manufacturing. It really is not, believe me, okay? So to get to cost of goods manufacturing, we start at the beginning with add the new costs throughout the year, and then that becomes the total cost of work in process. It's very similar to this. What you start with plus what you've added equals the total cost of whatever is, of, is going on, and then just bring that down and subtract the ending, and you get cost of goods manufacturing. And I go back to that, formula on the board there that I wrote vertically and I said that what is that it's really it is it's a methodology for doing a lot of different things right in this case the methodology is beginning plus additions equals what is available throughout the, the period reflected in dollars these are all dollar figures right minus what is ending is left over equals the cost of whatever you did that accounting period in dollars all these are dollar figures so beginning with in dollar figures plus the cost that we've added to it or the cost of it, all the stuff that we did during the, that particular accounting period, including the cost that we picked up from last uh, accounting period because it was, it was beginning. And we take out what's ending. So it must be the cost of goods that we made and that are finished are cost of goods manufactured. Okay. So I guess the only problematic with this is kind of goes it kind of zigzags a little bit, but it's the very same methodology as is expressed uh, over on, uh, on the board there, okay? Which by the way, is not, this is not a formula that's hard to find. We talk about this a lot in 2110, and, and the good news about that is, by the way, and I probably should emphasize this more, is the fact 
that if you've taken 2110 recently, um, well, it doesn't even matter if you've taken it recently or not. It's the same text that we use for 2110 and 2120. And so if you, if you think, hey, I need to go back and look at something because I don't know, I can't remember exactly what that is. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. I do that all the time, but I've been at this for a while. Sometimes I've got, I've got to look at something because I haven't seen it in a while. And uh, my brain doesn't capture everything. So sometimes I got to go back and look something up. And if you need to go back and look something up that you covered some time ago, perfectly fine. That is part of the process, okay? All right, so that's how we get to cost of goods manufacturing. How do we report it? Okay, so up to this point, we've showed you extracts of a income statement, extracts of a balance sheet. Those are all external reporting documents prepared according to GAAP, okay? This is a schedule. This is one of the first of these schedules that we're going to be looking at in this class. So, so what is a schedule? It looks like a financial statement. Well, that's... That's fine, and, and a lot of times these these are these reports do look like financial statements. They've got line items and dollar figures and all of that. They subtotals and totals and all, you know, usually a double line at the bottom, and that's fine. These are internal documents, and these are really these are interim steps in order to get to some reporting uh, w well before you get to reporting to external users. Okay, cost of goods manufacturing. Everything goes into this would be an internal report. I, I suppose some company, if they wanted to report this to the external world, that's their business. You know, usually more information is welcomed as opposed to less, but a lot of companies will do the bare minimum and it becomes difficult to, to sort of drill down into these individual line items when you've got companies with global operations and multiple products and, and whatnot, and they want it sort of that way, okay? But this is managerial accounting for management, for management to do things with. And it goes to the old adage of management that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so managers want to know what all these elements of cost are. So how do we get to cost against manufacturing? We start with the beginning working process. As in this case, we're going to go with a calendar year, fiscal year. Fiscal year is simply an accounting year, a budget year. Some companies use the calendar year. Uh, others have their own reasons for using a different year. But in this case, this makes our life Easier. January 1st, we had 18,400 in a work in process. And we have the three elements of manufacturing cost, direct materials, direct whatever manufacturing or manufacturing. So with direct materials, we started out with, and here we're getting into using this methodology to get to an ending cost, right? Which is ultimately going to flow all the way down. And it's the same sort of methodology that we've used in periodic inventory accounting. So we start with the beginning of raw materials. The raw materials that we purchased gives us the total raw materials available throughout that motion picture year, right? Minus what we have at the end of the year gives us the total cost of raw materials of 146.4, okay? Same methodology, and, and as we get going deeper in the class, we, we'll get into some of the, we'll, we'll drill into some of these a little bit more closely. So that's the first of the direct costs, right? Or the first of the manufacturing costs, which is the direct cost, 146.4. Direct labor is one line item. This is simple, 175.6. Direct labor is easy peasy compared to other of these costs. And the reason why is because there's usually no problem at all in accounting for direct labor because, first of all, the, 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 the workers who are whose, whose wages and benefits are assigned costs to, to inventory are well known, they're identified. And so, and we all know because they their their wages become part of the Cost of that particular operating unit that manufactures goods or produces a service or whatever the good is. Remember that line workers are involved in making the product, or delivering the service, or interfacing with customers. And so this is no problem. And, and businesses have long been required to keep good records of these costs. If for no other reason than to comply with the law, but also to, to make sure that workers are being paid accurately. Because a lot of the workers in this category are paid overtime and and, uh, and you want to make sure you reflect that. So that's easy. That's one, boom, one thing. Okay, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing, or a little bit more trickier. And we will talk much more in this class about overhead and what we do with it. We've got indirect labor, factory repairs, that would be part of the maintenance part of it, where maintenance it's really hard to attach any single product. Utilities, factory depreciation, insurance. These are like financial costs, but they become part of the product cost because they are related to the activity itself. So total overhead 
54A. If you add 146.4, 175.6, in other words, direct materials directly, the 54A manufacturing overhead, right? And you add all those up, um, you get 376.8. And then if you add 18.4 to that, you get, that's the subtotal, you get, you get 395, 200. And that's the total cost of everything you've got working on throughout the year. Minus what you did not finish, which is ending work in process. It's not finished, so you can't. Remember, the cost of goods manufacturers, the cost of making goods, finished goods throughout the year. Well, these aren't finished, so you got to take them out in the inventory. It's a bit, the work in process is an inventory account, by the way. And you get cost of goods manufacturing, and that's your bottom line. Okay? From there, cost of goods manufacturing ties in ultimately the cost of goods sold, and we'll get to that in a second. So. So this is, it's a little bit more involved. This is, I know this is not a, a particularly user-friendly schedule, but this is a very common format for a schedule that you might see for uh, an entire operating unit or business or whatever. Realizing, of course, that, that you may have many different uh, divisions that do different things. And they all have their own kind of reports or schedules, whatever you want to call them, and that they all fold into the bigger picture when statement preparation for external users is done, but uh, but this is done for individual use of managers. And by the way, uh, as we said last time, that the reporting um, schedule timeframe is much different in managerial accounting. It could be whatever management prefers. You could have one of these done, really, for every, every business, every day, if you want, every shift, if you want, every product within every shift. I mean, you can really slice and dice it. Obviously, there is cost to put some of this stuff together, and somebody's got to got to do the work. Some of it's automated; a lot of it's automated, including labor. Labor costs. There's not much. There's not much hunting and and and, and searching for it. Uh, so you can do it. And as technology gets better, we are better able to produce that in more or less real time. And by the way, I know some as we get going in this class, we will see some like things like invoices and purchase requ materials requisitions. And whatnot, it looks like it's a physical document, and that is increasingly obviously going by the wayside. A lot of managers simply do things with tablets walking around, they do things electronically, and uh, or simply put their code in and, and order things, authorize things using their password or whatever, and it's done that way. A lot of not, not very much paper, and there's not very much paper in our lives at all these days. That's a good thing, okay. When there's less paper, okay? So that's just an internal schedule of how we get the cost of goods manufactured. So we have an example here, and uh, this is a pretty good one. I don't always like, I sort of have a, have a love hate with some of these do it examples in the text, but I like this one because it kind of gives you a not so well organized bit of information to work with, okay? Which is in the accounting world, it's sometimes what we're dealing with is not so organized information. And we've got to kind of sort through and put it in its place. And uh, even though I know that not everyone is, is going to be an accountant, it is important to know what accountants are doing uh, with some of the information that's given. So here we want to we want to come up with cost of goods manufacturing. Given the fact that we've got beginning and ending raw materials, and it's just this month. For the month of March, so we got beginning and ending raw materials and beginning and ending work in process. These are inventory accounts, right? Expresses dollar figures, right? Because they're assets. We got materials purchased, that's like the purchases. Direct labor, which is easy again. Manufacturing overhead is given. So let's do it. And uh, and we don't have to do anything. We can just simply look at the solution. But we, we'll, we'll flip back and forth here and, and, and look at it. So we start with what? Very top line on this cost of goods manufacturing schedule. This is not a financial statement, it's an internal schedule. 2,500, where did that come from? Well, it's beginning work in process as of March 1st. We're gonna start with work in process, okay? Because we're gonna, uh, and, and presumably that is, by the end of this period, it's presumably done, it may not be done, but presumably it is. So you get 2,500. You've got raw materials then at 12,000 at the beginning of the period. That's beginning raw materials, 12,000. And you've got new purchases of materials, 90,000, which is, let me see, it's gonna come right under that, isn't it? Yes, it is. So you've got total raw materials of 102. By the way, as you're doing homework, quiz, and bonus, look at all these examples in the book just for, for reference, just to kind of flip back and forth. You've got 
there's no time frame, there's no time limit on homework. So you can spend as much time as you like. And I think you can go in and out, if, if I'm not mistaken. So you got raw materials, then what the raw materials that you did not use, which is ending raw materials, 10,000, that was given to us. Ending raw materials at March 31st on this information given. So that's this item up here in the upper right. Then we get down to, oops, went too far. We go to direct labor, which again is easy. It's just one line item. So 75,000. Then we got overhead, which is one line item. So you've got raw materials. We get beginning with, okay, we'll come back to that. You got raw materials, direct labor. Oh, I'm sorry, direct materials, direct materials, right? Direct labor, manufacturing or bid. These three guys here, these are manufacturing costs, product costs, right? Equals three hundred eighty-seven thousand plus the twenty-five hundred that's beginning work in process is three eighty-nine five, and we're subtracting out the ending work in process because it isn't done. Just like we separate ending raw materials because they weren't used yet, so we take it out, and then we get cost of goods manufactured. Boom! That's how we we get to that. That's how we compute that. That is a pretty good and uh, relatively, I think, straightforward example of how you would get to cost of goods manufacturing using these particular elements. And uh, and for however many business segments you've got in your accounting work, you would do it this particular way. And, and as we see that there's a lot of uh, reasons why companies want to know the cost of doing things. And, uh, and one main reason is that it helps you to make decisions, pricing decisions, uh, production decisions, if you're making and I think there's one example that I really like later in the book. You're making five different tennis rackets, and, and one of the tennis rackets simply isn't, make, isn't profitable for whatever reason I can't recall. So it may be that, hey, let's just, let's just stop making this tennis racket. It's not profitable. Uh, we'll go on making the others that we're making, but we'll drop one line. Rather than look at the entire company and say, hey, we're making money, we got to find out where the money's being made. And if it turns out that one of the areas is a drag on profits, a drag on these earnings, then maybe we shouldn't do that. Or maybe we fix it, or we do something different, but um, it allows some kind of decision. And at the end of the day, what are managers there for but to make decisions, okay? And this kind of then leads us into the whole purpose of what managerial accounting is. And this is sort of a preview of things that are coming. And that is we, we use managerial accounting information. Oops, whoa, I didn't want to do that. To assess the performance of managers. Primarily, okay. All right, so before we get to this, any questions about anything? Uh, I know we've got a few people on the Zoom link. Uh, any questions about anything we talked about with regard to really what we're talking about, how we get to cost of goods manufacturing and where it sort of ties into uh, to cost of goods sold? Cost of goods manufacturing, I should say, is, a, is an internal concept. It will probably not show up on an income statement, probably. If it does, it'll show up in, in the notes somewhere, if it does at all. But it's 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 a step analogous to purchases. And it's the cost of, of us making things as opposed to buying things. And it will ultimately become cost of goods sold when those goods are sold. Because right now, the cost of goods manufacturing is really the cost of finished goods for that particular, uh, for that particular time frame. Okay. Any questions before we get going here? Okay, well, we've got one final bit here to talk about, and that is just some of the uh, some of, of the things that we're going to be covering. Uh, there's some discussion in the book about and something I've been saying before that is uh, that a lot of the economy is moving more towards services rather than producing goods, and that is certainly the case. We've evolved as an economy, uh, particularly all the industrial economies, away from primarily agricultural to manufacturing to service and technology and uh, and one of the things that characterizes that is a not necessarily putting things together but producing services for the benefit of customers okay but about 80 percent of workers are employed by service companies these are these are private sector workers this would not include government workers i'm assuming because we've got a lot of government workers uh in the economy itself and they government does not make things per se when they do need things to be made, they simply hire private governments to do it, okay? So, and then there's a, an emphasis on the value chain. We're, we're gonna talk a bit about this. And th there's a lot of, in this final segment of the module that is, you know, sort of hitting a lot of different areas, but they're gonna be pertinent to where we're going. 
When we talk about the value chain, what, what's interesting about this concept is it's been around for a long, long time, but it's sort of entered the public consciousness during COVID because people began to be really uh, appreciative of the fact that there are links in the chain that go all the way from beginning to acquire the raw materials for a good, through production, through delivery and, and transportation and how it's marketed and all that. And when there are bottlenecks or interruptions there, it is, it is a, a problem. And it is kind of a daisy chain. And then there's any link of this, it's a very fragile thing. A daisy chain can obviously be broken. If there's, a, if there's an interruption, it becomes uh, problematic at times. But uh, the, the term value chain or supply chain, which is the way we've seen this, is something that I think probably a lot of people maybe sort of were aware of but weren't uh, that appreciative of until things happened where we couldn't get things, you know, like paper products or or whatever, or people were uh, unable to get certain electronics. I know that we here at CNN, I think there was some equipment we were trying to order that was coming somewhere in the Far East and it took a while to get here. It wasn't a huge delay, but it was it was a delay. And I forget what it was exactly. It didn't impact me at the time I heard about it. So a lot of us were impacted by that. Um, I think I ordered a toy for my son on Amazon, and I think it came from Australia. And uh, at least that's what it said on in Amazon. And it took a while to, to get there. Um, this was during COVID, so uh, I think we're all appreciative of that issue there. Okay. With regard to the value chain, there are some concepts and some buzzwords and some things we love acronyms and buzzwords and flavor of the month kind of things in in in. Uh, in, in, in the business world and including in accounting, something called JIT just in time. You may have heard of this before. It's not really new at all. It's been around for some time. And it's it's just, just in time is the idea that we get to as close to zero amount of inventory as possible. Obviously, zero inventory is, is more of a fantasy than a reality, but it's the idea of reducing the amount of inventory on hand because inventory on hand does nothing but tie up cost. And uh, entire resources uh, doesn't create anything. In fact, it creates additional cost and additional problems because it's got to be stored, uh, guarded, locked up, kept dry and clean, and you know, and uh, the longer it sits around somewhere, warehouse shelf, wherever somebody's going to damage it, drop it, run a forklift through it, something. So, uh, having as little inventory on hand as possible is is important. To my knowledge, this was really a, a something that. Well, the rest of the world borrowed from Japanese manufacturers beginning sometime, I think, in the 80s. And um, Japanese manufacturers were operating at a very lean manufacturing system. And uh, the idea was so popular, it caught on. And a lot of companies have adopted that, or companies that adopt inventory uh, to have as little inventory on hand as possible. Obviously, you can't have too little, but you're going to have, but having too much is equally problematic. And in the, in the manufacturing context, the the story that you often hear is the idea that theoretically goods should always be moving, that is physical items should be moving. As soon as it gets to the receiving dock, it ought to be moving somewhere. Somebody ought to be operating, it ought to be moving along. And when it's finished, it ought to be moving to the shipping dock and out the door and all that. And obviously, that is easier said than done, but that is a, an effort to try to reduce the cost of inventory because and you do it by lowering the time inventory sits around. In other words, for the inventory term that we talked about in chapter 10. TQM, total quality. Um, this is probably, you know, I know it, it got its start in manufacturing. I think the, the Six Sigma uh, concept, I believe, originated with Motorola also sometime in the 80s. This is when companies were really starting to, to feel the pressure of global competition. The U.S. was not dominating the world as much as it once was. And so they were adopting quality control measures to do things like lean inventory and flexible manufacturing systems and and, uh, and better logistics, all of which are still ongoing to this day. But TQ, total quality management, was this effort to try to, uh, to produce uh, as close to zero defects, that is, you know, defective products, damaged products, errors, mistakes, as possible. This translated over to the service sector as well. I know one of the companies I was working for in the 80s was just huge on this issue of of errors and trying to eliminate errors, which is a lot easier with machines than it is with people, but it's no less an idea. The term Six Sigma, Sigma is a statistical term that refers to standard deviation. 
away from some expected value. And as you get further away, in other words, the higher this number gets, the further you're at in terms of defects. And six sigma is basically, it's such an infinitesimally small number that it's pretty close to zero. Uh, knowing, of course, that zero defects is, is, is about as difficult to get to a zero inventory, but it's the idea of reducing errors. And so that is a, it's a management effort. It's ongoing. It's probably never going to go away at this point. And as we get better in terms of measuring defects and whatnot, I think this is going to continue to go on. So for those of you who are in, in, involved in manufacturing, you'll definitely see this. And I, I talked a bit about constraints a minute ago and bottlenecks. And these are things that interrupt the value chain, the supply chain as they go along. Examples, again, the green type is my own. Things like breakdowns of machinery, any kind of supply interruption, which may be sort of upstream, in other words, that from your own suppliers. If there are supply interruptions, there's nothing you can really do about it, but wait. Or maybe find other suppliers if you can. If, they're, if you can't, you're stuck with what you've got. But machine breakdowns are a little bit more controllable and what to do about them. And uh, but they can cause bottlenecks. In other words, the entire production chain, if you, not that everyone uses a formal assembly line, but to the extent that that concept applies, if, if, uh, if there's a, a break in that chain, everyone, everything else stops, it's bottleneck. I know I saw this a lot when I was in my first banking job, I was a commercial lender, and we had a lot of contractors, like companies that were contractors for bigger manufacturers who would be called upon to produce parts from broken down machines. These aren't parts that you can go to uh, Ace Hardware and get, they're gonna be fabricated. And so these companies would have just, you know, weird parts that have no other purpose than a particular machine. And so, because machine breakdowns are costly and they, uh, you know, you have workers standing around, nobody wants that, and that's a, that's a problem. Uh, global unrest, we certainly, I guess the pandemic qualifies for that. Strikes are difficult. Strikes obviously slow things down a little bit. And, and by the way, Sometimes there are operations that can't be shut down. You just can't turn off operations, you know, on a dime. You can't turn off oil wells, for instance. One of the reasons why oil is such a volatile uh, product, up, down, up, down, we all know that because we see the price of gas, is you really can't turn off an oil well once it starts. I mean, you can, you can cap it off, but it's, it's not that as easy as what it might seem. And it's that metaphor, too, that applies to other parts, particularly manufacturing, I've got a couple of uncles who I think I mentioned before worked in the Nat Coal plant making aluminum. One was in management, one was in labor. And so that was always interesting when they went on strike. And, uh, you know, the, the manager would, would have to cross the picket lines, but he was not bothered because he was not, he was a manager and they're not managers or by definition generally it's not part of the union, but they would have to run the operation because they could not shut down an aluminum plant. You have things that are heating things to thousands of degrees, and you can't turn those off. It takes weeks to turn them back on again. So you get the idea. Labor strikes can be a real bottleneck. And, uh, and if you're if you are a uh, certified union, you have the right under the law to strike. So it's an issue. Enterprise resource planning, we could be here all semester just talking about that. There are entire uh, courses and textbooks and, and uh, on this idea. This is basically using technology to to plan things out. Uh, when I say things, I mean pretty much everything, even things like HR and how we locate and how we qualify workers, how we source inventory, how we distribute inventory, how we market it. A lot of this is using artificial intelligence, particularly generative AI to, to generate ideas and creativity as to what we do within an organization. Uh, you will hear much more about that. Um, some of this is the, 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 the increase in in development of some of these products that are out there is just mind boggling. It's like magic, what some of this stuff can do. And uh, you are going to be familiar much more with this than what I am probably very soon. We are frankly in the accounting world trying to play a little bit of catch up on this because the technology is changing so quickly and it's definitely gonna affect our existence uh, and everyone's existence in the business world, all these uh, use of technology. Another uh, acronym we like is ABC, which is the activity-based costing. It's a way to, to, to get a better grip on overhead, which we said are in these indirect costs, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a method of costing inventory to account for the portion of that that is comprised of, of overhead. 
And we do it based upon some activity. And we usually link, it's often linked to labor. Labor usually is very directly correlated with overall cost. And, uh, and we use it as what we call a driver. And we're gonna, and we're gonna I think it's appendix F in the text. It's a separate module that we're gonna cover. It's, it's really important. It also has great applicability, very much applicability in service industries as well. So ABC costing is what we're gonna be uh, Getting into a bit more as we uh, as we get going. By the way, one thing about overhead is it sounds like this is kind of a, oh, a hodgepodge, a junk drawer, whatever you want to call it, of, of items, and it's not really that important, but we got to account for it. Overhead is a often a very, very, very big cost, and um, which is why we go to great lengths to try to figure out ways, different ways, to account for it, first of all, but then also to apply it to each individual product so we can find out. Uh, whether that particular product is profitable or not. And then we'll get into some specific um, decisions, some what ifs that managers have to make and they use managerial accounting information to do it. That is, do we keep making a product or, we, or, or, or do we stop making it altogether? Do we make it up to this point and stop making it? Do we, uh, do we got oil? Do we refine it up to gasoline and then stop? Or do we keep on refining it to get to kerosene or other kinds of things like that. Those are examples of, of what ifs, and, but in order to cost it, we have to include a lot of significant costs like overhead. And then uh, we're getting close to the end here. Balance scorecard, um, we're gonna cover this a little bit, not all that much. This is, some of this is a little bit beyond what we wanna go in this course, but it really is allows for assessment of management's performance. And that is a, a lot of the purpose of managerial accounting information is to assess how, how efficient, effective, and profitable a particular business area is, whether it's a, a shift, a business unit, a division, whatever. And, uh, and the balance scorecard is something that is a means of doing that, and it's usually very quantitative, although it does include non-financial measures, particularly when there are customers involved and you have things like surveys and customer feedback and things like that. Uh, we're not, the reason we don't get into it that deeply is because there is a lot of ground to cover, some of which gets into other areas that are not our, uh, out of our lane a little bit, okay? And then a couple more things, business ethics. Um, we talk a lot about this in financial accounting, and um, it's become a more important issue, particularly since the, the accounting scandals of the early 2000s, Enron, Global Crossing, Tyco, um, Worldcom, and there are many cases. They all kind of happen pretty much all at once, it seemed like. Um, and, um, and ethics became stressed more and more. And, and, and it's, 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 it's forced top managers in particular to be more and more responsible for what they do. And, uh, and that's important. And it's been codified by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. For anybody who is going to be an accounting or finance major, you are going to be much more familiar with this. This was passed in 2002, in a week particularly of the Enron scandal, which was just a monumental accounting failure. Yes, it was a management failure of the Enron managers, the top management of Enron, which was a utility in Houston, it was Texas, I know. But the, their accounting firm was also complicit in just funny, bloody accounting, just really ridiculous creative accounting in the worst way. I mean, we've all heard the term creative accounting, and it's usually a sort of a, a uh, a euphemism for something that's not not kosher. This was definitely not that. And uh, and so surveys obviously required a lot of things. In particular, it required certification by the CEO and CFO individually and personally that the financial statements that they are reporting to the world are correct and accurate. And that furthermore, they verify that the internal controls of the organization are sound and they personally are liable for that. They can be criminally charged if that is a false statement. And you might think, I think I've had some students who say, I can't believe that wasn't the law before that. Well, you're right. <laughs> I agree. It also talks about boards of directors and audit committees and the makeup of these. And it, it, this law is gigantic. I was looking at it about a month ago for some other reason. And it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And uh, that's pretty much all we're going to talk about that here. Other than to say it's mostly a financial accounting concept and an auditing concept. Uh, but it but it reinforces the idea that ethics are important, and that if we're talking about the reporting to management, 
these folks have got to rely upon good information because they're personally certifying things that they are really reliant upon. The CEO is not out there, you know, putting numbers together. That's not what the CEO does. It's not what the CFO does. So uh, this has led a lot of people to wonder whether or not they want to be a public company in the first place. So that's an issue, okay? And then uh, finally, the ESG issues, which I think I'm going to stop right there because we're about out of time. In fact, I've gone over just a little bit here. Uh, this is a good stopping point, but uh, it, it'll, I'll pick it up. I do want to say a little bit more about ESG because uh, it's going to come up a little bit later. It's becoming more and more important. It stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And it, it's, it's, uh, these are responsibilities being placed on companies. And I'll, but I'll talk more about that on Monday when we come back. So what we'll do, so you can begin to work on Chapter 11's homework quiz and bonus. But if you, if you want to wait, that's perfectly fine. You've got till the 29th to do that. But do please participate in the discussions this week uh, because that activity will close after this week. And then when we come back on Monday, I've got just a tiny bit to cover here. And then we'll get into uh, problems and exercises. And hopefully before the end of that class period, we'll begin to talk about Chapter 12. Uh, which deals with job costing. Okay, any questions before I wrap it up? I'm sorry I kept you a little bit over. I tend not to do that, but uh, uh, if you do have questions for me, uh, now's a good time, but uh, if now is not a good time, I'm available uh, the rest of the day and also throughout the weekend. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you next time.